Hi, Madora. Um, well, hello to our event this afternoon. We're really excited uh, to have FIMA here with us. Uh, and we really hope that you'll enjoy this event, which we're doing for the Student Success Project um, at the University of Kent. And we're from the School of European Culture and Languages. Um, so FIMA is a journalist at the Metro newspaper and Metro Online. Uh, and we're really grateful to Metro for loaning her out to us today. Um, she's going to talk to us about how she got into journalism, um, which is a difficult career to get into these days, uh, and also how important it is for young BAME voices to be heard in the media. Um, we especially wanted Faima to talk to, to talk to us today um, because we feel that what she's doing is really exciting and important, not least in the light of current events um, in the United States and elsewhere following the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and many others who've been unlawfully killed in recent years. Um, earlier this year, Faima and her colleague Natalie Morris started a series in the State of Racism, sorry, a, a series called The State of Racism, um, in which they decided to report on issues around racism and how it's uh, reported in the media and how it uh, manifests in society. And they were inspired to start the series after becoming more and more frustrated and outraged at the everyday racism they saw, um, and particularly with stories around Meghan Markle and um, the furore after the actor Lawrence Fox was on Question Time and said people were being racist towards him, a white male. Um, and so Fima has written about white privilege and she's written many stories uh, around these subjects about the myth of Muslim grooming gangs and the neglect of ethnic minorities. Um, in the British healthcare system, among many others. Um, I think her bravery in writing these articles um, is, is fantastic, but it has led to some difficulties, which she will tell us about. She's had some death threats, she's been trolled. Um, and at one point she did think, you know, is it all worth it? Um, but thankfully um, for us, she has decided to keep going um, because it's all the more important uh, today. So without further introduction from me, I would like to hand you over to Faima. So thank you so much, Faima, for coming today. And, thank you so uh, much for having me. Oh, Hi, everyone. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Philippa. Thanks, Laura. That was a, that was a very kind um, introduction. You said pretty much everything. Um, <laughs> uh, as Philippa said, I am a lifestyle journalist at Metro Online. Um, that is separate from the paper. Um, they have a completely different demographic readership um, interests and we're a bit more liberal. Um, I, I'm going to explain my journey into journalism um, and obviously if you have any questions just ask me, shoot at the end. Um, so I, a lot of journalists that I um, come across usually they, they knew they wanted to get into journalism since they were in school, at uni, they were part of the student paper but I sort of fell into it um, kind of quite randomly. I didn't realise I wanted to do journalism but um, when I was at uni I did English um, and I, I just enjoyed talking and writing like Facebook statuses and just ranting to my friends and then I actually ended up right, um, creating my own blog because I wanted to speak to an audience um, essentially um, and then I graduated and I still had no idea what I wanted to do. I tried my hand at academic publishing but it wasn't for me, I just found it really boring. Um, at the same time I was still continuing to write on my blog just about things that I was experiencing and I was also working part-time at Waitrose at the time which was like the best job ever. If anybody works at Waitrose you'll know it's actually a lot of fun. Um, so and all, all the sort of experiences I had just working as a retail worker I, I would just you know just write about those things um, and they would often have, I'd have often you know um, interesting conversations um, that I'd write about later and then I started working for unpaid internships and just getting my writing out there and you know making a name for myself and, and just sort of developing my writing style as well um, and I, I tried to approach up-and-coming publications like um, Galdem who um, who are actually thriving right now they are if you know Galdem you know that they'll they, they do um, the center stories on black, brown, uh, indigenous, uh, non-binary people. Um, so this was a couple of years ago when they were just starting out and I'd, I'd pitched to them and they let me write for them. Uh, and that was just a way of just getting my writing out there. And then eventually I realized this is something I want to do a career in. And then I applied for the NCTJ, which is the traditional qualification that you do to get into journalism, but not everyone does it. My editor, for example, she doesn't have that qualification. 
um, but obviously she's an editor so you can get into journalism um, via work experience and stuff but um, for me I thought you know I'm, I don't have anyone that I know that's in the industry um, so I'm going to get I'm going to go through th um, and get the qualification um, some people choose to do the degree um, I know that some universities like City offer the journalism MA which is really highly you know um, coveted so you know but I didn't want to do a year-long study um, when I could have done it in 17 weeks which is how long my NCTJ course was um, the diploma was with the press association um who obviously are one of the biggest um, news agencies in the world and um so that was a really good experience but 17 weeks to study obviously is, is a lot it's very intensive um and i had to do my shorthand as well which is um if any if there are journalism students you probably will know what shorthand is but it's just a quicker way to write because uh, obviously people speak faster than you can write so um i had to develop a way to quickly to write it all down because you might not always have the technology um and i was able to achieve 100 words a minute so i got my nctj qualification uh, and then i applied for a grad scheme which led to um the job i do right now um so it was a one-year grad scheme um and as part of that traineeship i had to do um i had to do work experience with a regional newspaper so I had to move out, move out and um, live in Oxford for two months I worked with the Oxford Mail and I also worked with a news agency Southwest News Service uh, in Cambridge so I lived in Cambridge for a month um, which was really interesting to get the two sort of Oxbridge um, towns um, but it was it was a really interesting experience especially um, at the agency because on the first day I was actually sent out to do a job um, and I had to do a death knock and death knocks um, in journalism is when someone dies and then you have to go out and investigate the circumstances of their death and you have to get information on how they died um, and you know get a quote about who they were as a person and just just a few exclusive lines um, essentially um, this was my first day obviously I don't know anybody I don't know the town I don't know what I'm doing um, I have a laptop I didn't have a car so the photographer had to drive me to the scene it was actually a two-year-old girl who had fallen into a, a pond a canal and she, she passed away because she, she drowned um, and then the editor said to me take the photographer go out and um, get as much information as you can so I'm there on my first day driving with this photographer I don't know what I'm doing and then uh, I, got, I got quite lucky it sounds quite morbid but I got quite lucky because the little girl's uh, brother she he was there he was he was mourning in, in front of the scene where she died and um, my editor was like, you have to speak to him, he's there, you know it's the brother, um, so just get some um, information from him. So I had to approach him really respectfully, you know, and say, I'm really sorry that I, I'm doing this, but, you know, can you tell me about your sister? What was she like? What was her name? Uh, and so on. And then I had my editor call me and say, can you get some information about the mum? Because we want a quote from the mum. So then I had to even more awkwardly have to call this grieving mother and, you know, just intrude into her life uh, about her, her two year old daughter who passed away the day before. So you can only imagine the kind of trauma she was going through. But um, she was very nice, very willing to chat. And we had a conversation, um, hung up, got my information. Then we find out that a national publication wants, wants the story, but they want more information. So my editor calls me and says, go to the mum's house. So I got the address from the boy uh, and he, yeah, so we, we drive out to the mum's house and um, obviously at this point I'm super nervous and this is still my first day, um, but I got really lucky because she was actually throwing her bin out and um, so I sort of just like, you know, accosted her and just had to apologise profusely, like, I'm so sorry that I'm doing this, um, but, you know, we'd really like some more information, if you could just share the essence of, you know, I've forgotten her name now, oh, um, I feel horrible, but if you could just share the essence of who she was as a person, uh, and just, you know, just tell us about her personality and so on, um, luckily she was very nice, she gave me everything that I needed, and I got my, um, I got my story, and I got a national byline the next day, um, so it was, it was like a 12-hour shift on the first day, I had to deal with the a death of a toddler but it was it was very um an interesting experience because i obviously learned i'd been pushed into the deep, deep end and sometimes you have to as a journalist you know do very uncomfortable things um but yeah i uh, i learned a lot from it um and then um yeah so I, I passed my traineeship i came back to london in 2018 and then i um I got in, placed into the job that I'm currently doing, which is Metro Lifestyle, um, which is actually a lot of fun for the most part. Um, my editor is really lovely and she tells me, you know, if there are stories that you want to work on, even if you're not sure that people might not necessarily engage with or understand, do it. If it just 
to serve your own because obviously as a, as a writer there are certain things I'm interested in and she sort of gave me the freedom to own my own stories and write whatever I want um, and, and to that end I've, I've written in the past two and a half years I've written about 2,500 articles so obviously we have a really quick turnaround we do the very quick short trending stories um, of just food fashion health families but also um the more longer features that we like to do um for me my, my particular interests are race uh religion uh class gender um that sort of thing um so uh, and, and the same for all of my colleagues as well um natalie her interests are um similar to mine uh, in that you know we, talk, we, we, we we both write about racism quite a lot so a few months ago we decided to launch our series the state of racism uh at the beginning of the year because we thought it's a new decade and um it feels like you know a, a lot of people believe that there is britain doesn't have this same problem of racism that the us does because obviously the us one is in some ways a lot more obvious because you see you know police brutality gun crime that sort of stuff um, but me and Natalie felt like Britain has a huge, obviously has a hist historical problem with racism, but it's also something that's, you know, it's a contemporary problem as well. And it was just wasn't getting covered enough. Um, and we saw just in like the last year alone, saw this continuation of racism against Meghan Markle, which was amplified when obviously Harry and Meghan decided to leave the royal family or drop their titles rather and uh, and then when people like Lawrence Fox come on television and then they deny and they gaslight people of color by saying that white privilege doesn't exist and um, that sort of thing um, and between the two of us me and Natalie are the only people of color on our desk but between the two of us we managed to write about racism at university racism in the NHS racism in the charity sector um, and also just do very very simple explainers which actually turned out to be our biggest hits. Um, so for example I did one on a very very basic one called what is the, the definition of what is the definition of racism that you hold because most people in Britain and in America would say that the meaning of definite the definition of racism is a hatred of a person's skin color but what often happens is that they miss out on the sort of the structure the structural um system of oppression that racism is so it's easy to recognize the killing of george floyd as racism because obviously this is a, a white man who's got his neck on a black man's neck he's got his uh, knee on a black man's neck so obviously um, that's racism but at the same time people deny institutional racism which you can't see but black and brown people know it, that it absolutely exists so it can be quite frustrating because there's like a disconnect happening between what people think is racism and what isn't um so yeah we did loads of different um and it was a six week investigative series uh, and we had loads of um loads of different kind of um stories some really big ones some really simple explainers um and we had a really strong reaction especially at the beginning um the really good engagement as well and this was just you know a month before the pandemic hit so we, we you know it was really nice to see that people were actually reading our stuff and then the coronavirus stuff came out and naturally people's attention shifted uh, which was hard for us because we all, we had loads of other it was meant to be an eight week um investigation uh, investigative series but we had to um just qu uh, quit two weeks early just because we just wasn't getting the same level of engagement and we didn't want these sort of stories to get ignored um so we sort of put a pin in it um and a lot of it was positive but some of it was very negative um as philippa mentioned um natalie her, was she got a call from the uh, from counter extremism um departments just telling her that her um, she needs to be a bit careful with what sites she goes on because a lot of our share a lot of our work was being shared on um far right websites and sort of very dodgy corners of the internet and um, I'd, I'd also been getting a huge amount of abuse uh, on an article that I wrote about Muslim grooming gangs. Um, I didn't actually realize it was so controversial uh, as it was. Um, it was an opinion piece right at the end of it, because every time I write about um, the Muslim community, the one piece of criticism I always get is, what about Muslim grooming gangs? What about, that's the one thing people continuously say to me, um, as if that's like a huge, massive problem that's like, you know a big part of our community when we're obviously a lot we're a lot more than that and um so i just did an opinion piece like literally a very i thought quite inoffensive piece just saying that there is no inherent problem with islam as a religion that perpetuates um sexual abuse it's 
these very, very bad men, these very, very bad people that took advantage of very, very vulnerable girls and women. Um, so I, I sort of try to separate these pe bad people, you know, bad apples essentially from the rest so Islam is a religion of how like a billion people not everyone in the same way that white um, criminals don't speak for white people um, Muslim grooming gangs do not speak for all Muslims that's essentially what I was trying to say but a lot of people took that to mean that I was saying that Muslims don't care about sexual grooming victims actually and obviously I was getting a lot of a uh, lot of hate on Twitter I had to delete my tweet uh, I was getting ratioed, which I didn't actually know the meaning of. It's when you get more comments than you get likes. So people are basically trying to say to you, you're, what you're saying is wrong. And, you know, they're just repeating the same things um, on and on. And then it started getting really bad because I started getting death threats and, and rape threats. Um, some really, really dark emails, you know, being like, um, you're going to have this, you're going to um, suffer the same um, fate as as the, the, the victims of, of like Watchdale or whatever, which was obviously a thinly veiled rape, um, rape threat. Um, also, they said that they had my address um, and they posted it online, which was obviously very scary to read because you know, anything's possible on the internet. Uh, and there are very tech savvy people that can very easily find that information. Um, so when I when I got those kind of emails, I had to report it to my senior managers and managing editors, um, and they were all very good. They reacted really quickly and they called the police um, that day. And then uh, the Met Police got in touch with me, and I actually received an email this morning saying they found one of them, one of the men that had um, had sent me those threats, and they arrested him. But he has mental health issues and he lives in Warwick and he doesn't have a car so what obviously they're trying to say to me is you don't have to worry because he's far from you and he can't travel to you and um especially as the threats were at the beginning of lockdown he couldn't have traveled to me because the country was obviously under a national uh, lockdown um but obviously that is still a huge threat and it is it's scary especially when you know that people who are full of hate do very dangerous things like we've seen with joe cox with uh christchurch it is you know you don't know what people like capable of so when i first got those death threats i remember like every time the door would like would ring i would just be like let me get it because i live at home with my family and i was just very worried that what if you know my my dad's um got, he's, he's old like i don't want him to just go out there and then someone does something to him or you know so that was a very scary time and um, I, was, I would sort of like get a bit shaken every time the door would ring um and i sort of stopped any packages coming to the house because i didn't want to open the door to any strangers and um one of my friends actually wanted to send me like a gift package or something and I was just like I'd rather not rather not get any kind of packages right now so it's a shame that the, the stories that we write and put out there had an actual effect on our lives but unfortunately that is just the case for when you're a woman of color online um and not just journalists politicians too Diane Abbott gets like a hate message every four seconds or whatever it is um so it, it is obviously um it's it's sometimes risky, but at the same time, it's all the more reason um, for us to keep pushing to, to write st um, stories like this. Um, and in topics like this, they need to they need to be talked about because the, the media has been for so long um, telling sort of dated stories and perpetuating the very same stereotypical type of content. Um, and also, it, it chooses. Um, um, you know which stories to um, publicize and um, I actually got a, a Twitter message the other day from someone who, who lived in Watchdale who grew up in Watchdale in the, in the 1990s and he messaged to say that actually the media did blow out everything that happened out of proportion um, and Muslims do tend to get extra um, attention when the, when it's a sto story of sexual abuse or terrorism. There are actually studies and statistics to prove that they receive like it's sort of like a ridiculous number, like five hundred more percent coverage. Um, so, which is why we need to sort of um, we need we need journalists to be able to give the flip side and give a give a different um, perspective of of the sort of stories that we see so often um especially right now as well with everything that's going on i think a lot of newsrooms and uh, you know media rooms are realizing that actually um this problem of racism is so much bigger um and so much more prevalent than maybe we realize it's literally everywhere it's every part of you know society um like we were talking earlier about universities and um, a lot of universities are obviously saying because everyone feels compelled to say something because you know the the consensus is right now if you're 
silence is compliance. So if you're not saying anything, then you're doing nothing to dismantle racism. Um, but at the same time, people that are saying things like, you know, I know that a lot of universities got a lot of flack in the last few days about, you know, um, for speaking out against racism. But at the same time, a lot of students and staff members, they know that racism is, with, is within those institutions. or a press release or whatever on your happening at the same time do nothing internally um, to fix that and also fix um, how because obviously the higher you go up in in any organization the, the whiter it tends to be um, and especially in, in London which is one of the most diverse cities in the world we have we're home to some of the biggest um, publications uh, in the country but if you go into a newsroom it doesn't reflect outside world um so that's all the more reason that we need we need to keep keep um pushing for diversity and thankfully we're actually at a time where there are those opportunities available um for example when i did my nctj i forgot to mention this um i did it about three three four years ago now um i couldn't afford it i was at, just working at waitrose uh it was you had to pay up front four thousand pounds and you, you can't get student finance for it uh, I was fresh out of uni, didn't really have the money for it. Um, so I just sort of um, Googled my options. I was like contacting like this random organizations asking if, if, they, if they offer scholarships and things like that. And I came across something called the Journalism Diversity Fund. Um, and thankfully they, they were willing to, to chat to me to get my, um, you know, to, to listen to my circumstances. I had a bunch of interviews with them and I showed them. And this is where all the unpaid internships that I did came, came in handy because I could show them, look, this is my work. Uh, I am committed to it and um, this is what I want to do. I just need the money for, like, to, to, to get that sort of um, stepping stone and to get into journalism. I, I need you to, you know, to, to fund, fund it. And um, luckily I got the Journalism Diversity Fund uh, scholarship and they paid for my expenses, um, which obviously, as if you live in London, especially, it's, it's ridiculous, just the cost of living. Um, so I was very fortunate um, in that sense. Um, so yeah, that was sort of just um, my journey into journalism and just the state of racism. Um, I also wanted to talk about the future of digital media. Um, obviously, it's a very precarious time right now because you know, pandemics aren't good for business. Um, but it's, 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 it has to be a hard. Uh, obviously, I'm very fortunate in that I've, I've, I've got my job. I've been able to work. Uh, I'm a full time staffer. I've got my set hours. I don't have to worry. But for a lot of freelancers, it's been really tough because budgets are being cut. And, um, newsrooms are, are, are downsizing, and it's just it's a really tough time. But I don't I don't want to discourage young people because, you know, because the, there's always going to be a need for fresh young BAME voices um, to to tell the other side of the story uh, or just to bring in a different aspect, and especially for Generation Z because you because the generation is, is is living in such an interesting time where you're so young but you're going through an economic crisis but you know young millennials are going through too they went through the uh, you know the the recession and then now this pandemic and you know it's just it's just a weird time and it'll be really interesting to see how how that shapes young people um and um you know it, there's definitely a need to, to get those those kind of uh, fresh perspectives in there um um what was I going to say? Sorry, I've got loads of notes. Um, yeah, so I was also going to mention how we, the, there is such a huge need to shake up digital media. Um, print media has always been very elitist. It's very been very pale and male, but digital media unfortunately falls into the into the same sort of trap. Um, and you know, ninety four percent is uh, is white um and, and tends to be male especially the higher up you go uh and 0.4 percent come from a muslim background but they make up eight percent of the population and 0.2 percent of um journalists are black despite making up three percent and those numbers obviously sound quite small but these are millions of people um and and the newsroom isn't a reflection of that um and also it's in the best interest for not just journalism for any industry to to um, utilize diversity and not just in a superficial way but if you have these people in your boardrooms in your in the in, in you know uh, higher up positions they can stop so many 
you know, scandals. For example, if you think of H&M, the big, huge scandal they had with the jumper saying, you know, the coolest monkey in the jungle or whatever, um, you know, that affected their profits, that affected the business. If they just had one person in, the, in, their, in, this, in their boardroom to be like, actually, that sounds quite questionable, let's maybe not do that. Like they could have saved their, their reputation or when publications or magazines or, or even the BBC or whatever, when they get mixed up with two black people, it always happens with Stormzy and, and you know, Lukaku, the footballer. And it's just, it's ridiculous. And actually there is a lot of research to, to show that um, it's difficult for, for people to differentiate between um, races if they haven't been exposed to those kind of races. Um, or something along those lines. So, you know, companies need to, to make an active, a conscious effort to address those unconscious biases. Because the thing with unconscious bias is that, you know, it's unconscious. So you don't know what you don't know. Um, but I think we have to operate in a way that we assume that there is conscious, everyone has unconscious bias. Um, and if we just operate on the, on the basis that we, we, we have biases against and prejudices against people that's built in us, um, I think that's the only way we can move forward. Um, but yeah, uh, and you know, there is hope. I know I've said a lot of negative things about the media and how it's such a precarious time, but there is definitely hope. Um, there's always going to be a need for journalists, journalists of colour. There's always going to be a need for young people, uh, queer people, disabled voices, all those kind of things that we need. Um, uh, as long as people exist, this, the thirst and the interest and the appetite for stories, it's always going to be there. Um, and unfortunately, you know, in, in recent times, it has taken a huge tragedy, like with with George Floyd and Amy Cooper, to show that actually we should have been given, we should have given uh, a lot more time and attention to to the plight of Black people in in, in the West. Um, but you know, and thankfully, we are seeing some sort of positive changes from from people trying to ad address the imbalance that we've we've seen for so long. I've seen personally on on Twitter and so on, um, editors and publications actively saying, "Well, we're actually looking for uh, black writers. We're looking for black um, photographers, black um, you know content creators and, and that sort of thing, which is which is nice to see." And you know, some people might be like, you know, that's a bit racist. Why black people? Why not white people or, or Asian people or whatnot? But it's just, it's literally just an attempt to, like I say, redress the, the balance, imbalance that we've seen for so long. Um, we haven't given black people the opportunity to own their stories, uh, to even tell, tell those stories. Um, so now we have to make a conscious effort to give them resources and time and attention and, and money as well. We need to support and donate. To, to all of these different causes. Um, and hopefully as well, I wanna say um, that these people that control so much of what we consume, hopefully they'll realize that we shouldn't just reply, rely on people of color to uh, tell stories of trauma, um, that these are actually hugely talented people that can not only work with very complex phenomena and break it down into very digestible information but also that we do have other other talents and you know not just you know we, we have other interests as well like for me personally i'm highly interested in gender um and actually one of the my biggest pieces was about um feminism it was a opinion piece entitled um it's not women's responsibility to make men better human beings uh, which was off the back of um, Ariana Grande when she got a lot of abuse after her uh, pa her partner Mac Miller passed away and she was getting a lot of abuse just being like why did you not stay with him uh, and my piece was basically saying that you know women are so often expected to be the emotional caretakers of men to be the rehabilitation centers for men uh, and we very rarely ex expect that back from from men um, so, which is a huge burden, and a lot of a lot of people um, related to that, and it actually turned out to be um, the it was the most read article of, of lifestyle in 2018, um, which was the which was an amazing opportunity because it feels like when you're a person of color in journalism, the only thing you can offer you're you're a bit of a one trick pony. So to have one of my biggest pieces be on something that wasn't necessarily about race, but something that that affects all, all of us, race does affect all of us, but you know, some, something other than race, um, it was, it was a, you know, an amazing opportunity and it's something that I want to um, sort of cover in, in future. Um, and I'm in a position, thankfully, where I'm able, I've got the um, opportunity to cover those kind of stories and 
um, you know, depending on if if you do want to get into journalism, there will you know as long as you you are willing to do the work. Unfortunately, you know, at the moment it just means you have to push through a lot more more doors and more barriers, especially if you're a BAME. But it, it you know the opportunities are still there, and um, there are loads of different um, areas you can go into. I would obviously do print um, online journalism uh, online journalism you can go to broadcast you can do radio podcasts podcasts are huge right now um there are so many different avenues um, available right now you know we are in the digital age there are so many things um that, that you can try and do um i think that's pretty much everything that i wanted to talk about uh, i probably have missed out because i made some notes but i forgot to look at it like completely um so if you have any questions or if, if i if i sort of like sped through anything and you'd like to me to sort of slow it down or um, mention something in a bit more detail please please shout um or if there are anything specific that you want to know about that i haven't covered um or anything about the series please let me know great thank you so much Baima. that's um that was really really cool um so just while everyone's thinking about their questions um as i say if you want to ask a question then please either press the raise hand button in the participants panel or type it into the chat box um while you're doing that and thinking of your questions we had one question um from okay. vikram athwal while you were talking who asks <laughs> um did Fima ever get a backlash from members of her community or cultural pressures from people within her own family Yes, that's a really good question. Actually, I, I, I did, and I do, I do get backlash from my own community. Sometimes it feels like when you air certain internal community dialogue, it feels like you're doing them an injustice. By obviously, some things are private. For um, one of the biggest examples of that is um, when I actually this was my concern, but actually it turned out to be much better than I thought it would be. I was sexually abused when I was a child. Um, and, and it happened uh, by a, a priest, a Muslim priest. Uh, obviously, it's a huge, like, I really debated whether I should, because obviously, have, now that you know I wrote about grooming gangs, you can see the sort of, you know, um, the kind of story that I, the connection between the two. Um, so when I, when I wrote that, this was two years ago, before I'd done the grooming gangs piece, um, I was really, really uh, wary of what people would say. But at the same time, as a victim of sexual abuse, obviously, that was my story to own. Um, so I was very careful, very, very concerned about what people would say, whether they would sort of like cancel me for, for just, you know, putting out a very al already controversial uh, topic out there. Um, but luckily, everyone was really supportive. They totally understood that that was something that I had full ownership of. Um, so I didn't receive backlash for that, but it's something that I did think about, like, you know, what if people actually are offended by the fact that I am putting out a very stereotypical idea of, you know, Muslim men as being predatory and so on. Um, another, another time where I've received, um, you know, actually the only time I've received um, backlash has been when I wrote about um, dating trends, I think, in the community or whatever, and it was, it was very... Uh, you know, um, I thought a harmless piece about why it's hard for, for Muslim women to get married. And a lot of the women said, oh, it's because the Muslim men are not good enough, <laughs> which was their opinion. <laughs> and I, I repeated that. And obviously I didn't change anybody's quotes because that's, that's their opinion. And I got some backlash from, from men and, and, so, and some women as well that were saying, you know, you're, again, you're putting out this view of, of Muslim men being culturally inferior. So that's one thing that journalists of colour have to think about. How am I representing my community? Am I doing them justice? Am I adding to, to a already you know, conceived stereotype? Um, should I maybe not talk about this? Maybe this is, this is not the right platform? Because obviously the metro demographic is largely white. So what business do they have knowing about the dating trends of the Muslim community? So those are things that you, have to, you do have to consider sometimes. That's a good question. Okay. Um, I would especially like to encourage, there are lots of students here, and I know that some of those students will be thinking of going into journalism. Um, <laughs> so I would especially uh, con you know, like to suggest that those students should ask any questions. This is a really great opportunity to ask questions uh, now. Um, I don't know if, um, you know, you mentioned a few different ways of kind of getting into journalism. Like, so you did the NCTJ um but you can also do a degree or you could you know mm -hmm. you talked about a few different ways would you say like 
you know, do you feel like the way you did it was the right one for you or better in general? Or is like, would you recommend different ways for different people? Um, for me, what I, the way I did it, I, I thought that was perfect for me because um, obviously, like I say, I, did, I didn't realise I wanted to get into journalism until I was like, I'd graduated and I'd obviously worked in publishing for like six months. So by then I was like 21, 22. So I already felt quite old and I didn't want to spend more time. Obviously, that's not old age at all. But at the time I was like, oh my God, I'm like, you know, I'm ancient. Um, I can't, I can't do another degree on top and become even more old and get into journalism even later. So I thought I'm going to go for the shortest, you know, the shortest route possible, which was the 17 week course. Um, and that was actually really enjoyable. It was so stressful because 17 weeks to learn an entire year's worth of content. You can imagine how tough that is. And that was probably the most stressful time in my life. I was waking up at 6 a.m. every day to study before I went to class. I was studying on the train, studying you know, throughout my classes and then again on the train and then coming home and studying some more. So it was literally just like hours and hours of endless study. Um, but I think there is, it really depends on the kind of student you are. If you need the time, definitely think about a degree, maybe part time, maybe get some experience at the same time if you do do it part time. Um, and I know that the city MA, the journalism MA is really um, like, it has a really good reputation as well. And I know some of my most talented journalist friends did do the MA. Um, so it really depends on, on who, what your, um, you know, what kind of a student you are, what kind of areas you want to go into. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's a question in the chat uh, from Rafman. Um, do you receive or feel pressure from non-BAME employees to address issues just because it would be more palatable from a person of colour? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, because I've only, it's, um, it's a bit weird on because I've only ever written for Metro because that's been my first and current job. So everything I get to write about, I get paid the same regardless of whether I write about food or racism um so it really depends um so I, i've never felt that pressure from my editors because they know that if if i if they want me to do a feature a, a long feature a reported feature on on something complex i can deliver that but if she wants me to do a very quick one on a makeup brand i can also do that but i do know that my freelance friends and other journalists of color have really struggled with that because sometimes you do want to talk about things that are not necessarily not necessarily very complex uh, you do, or or like you know, gender or whatever um actually something does come to mind um we do get asked to co to go on tv and stuff like that uh, i've been asked to go on good morning britain a few times um, and at one time I got asked to do a debate with, uh, was it Piers Morgan at the time or someone else, I can't remember, was about whether it's offensive to call white people white people because I'd written a piece on it. And um, obviously if you go on a show with Piers, you're going to probably become a meme, go viral, have to deal with that, with that backlash and, and so on. And, and, and it's, it's something like every single time I've been asked to do a media opportunity, like on TV or even radio sometimes, it's always tended to be very, very complex things. Whereas my editor, she got to go on TV for something um, to do with clapping which is such a sort of like a trivial, a trivial sort of easy, lighthearted thing that she could have fun with. And it's a, it's a shame that journalists of colour don't really get to do this more fun, lighthearted things. Great, thank you. Sorry, I was trying to multitask there. Um, so um, another question in the chat, uh, Henna asks, uh, well, says thank you for your time, first of all, and asks, where do you hope to see yourself in five years time with regards to your career in journalism? That's a really good question. <laughs> I don't know because <laughs> it's such it's such a weird time. Um, I guess I I do definitely see myself in in um, online journalism. Um, ideally, I would have made, carved a more of a niche for myself because um, at the moment I cover a plethora of of, of areas. Um, but I think um, you know a lot of right journalists want to write a book um my colleague natalie who who's who did state of racism with me she couldn't be here today because she's writing a book on the mixed race um experience in the uk so it feels like that's the sort of route that you go you know after doing journalism for a few years you write a book and then you have your own podcast or i don't know um i think the dream would be would, for me would be to do a range of things um i'd love to write um for a publication I don't know, maybe two days a week and then do other things um, with different forms of media, maybe a podcast or um, maybe even broad broadcast, like, you know, just do different things. I think that's, I think, the yeah, I'd like to do something with a lot of variety. Um, 
Aisha asks, um, did you have really good mentors or managers who supported you in your career and have you ever felt held back? Um, I don't, I can't think of any particular people, but there are loads of, um, not loads, there are a few organisations that have been really helpful. Um, if you want to get into the, create, um, the creative industry, not necessarily journalism, there's, some, there's a charity called Creative Access. They're excellent. They were really good um, with, to me. Um, they have really highly coveted uh, paid internships, which is so important. Um, they're six month paid internships um, uh, with like the BBC, ITV, um, you know, big names uh, at Financial Times. Um, and um, when I when I had applied for my internship, with them at the time I didn't realize I, was, I wanted to be a journalist so it was I, I applied for publishing but they they were very helpful in that they pushed me to go into publishing Un, you know unfortunately it wasn't for me so I gave up but but since then they've been very supportive of my career they always invite me down um, when they have master classes they have really excellent master classes as well they will they do talks at Google and Twitter and just give you the chance to network which is so important because you know, a lot of people don't have the access the resources I didn't know any journalists until I got into journalism and even when I was doing my NCTJ on the first day we were asked to stand stand up and introduce ourselves and why we wanted to get into journalism and I realized that the majority of the other journalists who were white had a lot of people who worked at the Guardian at the Times and so on and one of the girls her dad owned a football club so it was very people with very different lived experiences to me um, but yeah there are, so yeah definitely check out creative access who, who, who are, you know, are really useful um, in, in that um, Lynn, did you catch that creative access was, was it? Um, great. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, there's a load of questions in the chat. Let me just yeah. compile. There are two questions from one person, which I'll put together. Um, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a complex one. <laughs> okay. um, so how do you deal with the pressure of feeling like you will inevitably be seen as a voice piece for others of your ethnic or cultural background? And do you think that's a fair portrayal, given that it seems to be particularly attributed to people of colour? Um, and kind of following on from that, um, the, the asker read something about the dissonance between people getting people to understand your point of view and also acknowledging that they probably never will. And can you speak about how to tackle that? And then the asker apologizes for it being vague. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that vague. <laughs> okay. Um, the second part of that question, I, honestly, uh, that's a good, really good question. Um, the first part, the, the pressure to, there is hundred um, percent a pressure to be a one trick pony. Um, because it's the only kind of, especially as a freelancer, it's the only kind of opportunities you tend to get um you know when something it's, it all it kind of feels like um when something happens these sort of editors are they have like a some sort of database of like ethnic voices that they just have like on the rotation they're like oh you know what? we haven't spoke to her for a while we're just going to reach out to her and see what her, her th thoughts on george floyd are um so there is definitely and then you feel and then you feel bad if you say no to it because you're like well someone needs to write about it and if i don't write about it, then who will and then you worry if uh, you know a more inappropriate voice might pick it up instead so it so i feel like being a person of color journalist it's it's a constant sort of battle sometimes of wanting to do something or and saying saying like um i think this is something natalie really struggles with she's constantly because she's a mixed race black woman and when Meghan markle stuff was happening every media opportunity she got was can you can you comment on Meghan markle and she obviously has a very d diverse range of stories as well like all of us on the, on the on the desk and she had to keep saying no and these were like paid opportunities because you know people do want to make money but at the same time at, at what cost like that's so she uh, you know i obviously um that's really commendable i think she said no to a lot of um paid opportunities just because she didn't want to be that person and i think when she says when she said no to the, those opportunities i hope and I've had to say in a, in a few, for in a few uh, occasions as well. I hope that the people asking realise that oh, you know what, you know, we probably shouldn't keep doing this. Like we need to reach out to these people for other reasons as well. Uh, and the second part was: is there a disconnect of when we want to give up? Is that what he what, what they said? Uh, yeah. So like the disconnect between like trying to get people to understand your point of view but also acknowledging that they probably won't and how okay. to kind of deal with that okay. yeah this is such a hard thing to do because when when someone is very um provocative naturally you want to 
you know, you, you get defensive and you want to explain to them. Um, and this is something that happens when I get personal emails. Um, uh, when people are just very much like they deny everything that you're saying and then you just want to you obviously as uh, it's human nature to want to get rude back or just swear at them or just do something that's a bit cathartic and just be like tell them to fuck off or whatever but you can't you have to hold back and um in, in you sort of just have to realize that it's yeah you, ha you have to know you have to know when to fight your battles um, if it's if it's a troll that's tweeting you and has you know they, they have no like um, profile picture and they've got like zero followers well you know that that person has is a troll account there is no point in you investing your time into talking to them if it's someone who emails you abuse you don't you, you don't need to engage with that you can report it block it or um, and so on um, it's harder when people that you admire sort of criticize you um, and it can make you feel like, oh my God, I need to fix this, I need to change this, I need to write something in response to that. Um, so yeah, I guess it really depends on how the person has, uh, has approached you. Um, I feel, but it, it can, it can feel, you know, quite often it can feel like, you know what, I'm just not bothered to do this. It's not worth the aggravation that it comes with, uh, especially when it's so con like con continuous, like the grooming gangs thing that happened so often. Um, that's why I felt like I had to put out the opinion piece. And after that, I sort of decided like, I'm not writing about sexual abuse ever again, because it's too controversial and it always will be. And, um, I don't want to, um, I feel like I've said enough of what I want to say and um, I, there's nothing new I can add to it and also I just want to put myself through through all of that again. Yeah, yeah, understandable. Um, Lynn asks, um, says thank you so much and can you talk more about your experience as a, a BAME journalist? So like before what happened to George Floyd, as a journalist do you feel like your articles on race or anything else were given the same attention and consideration as white colleagues? Um, it's interesting because our series is straight say racism we did that um three months two three months ago but since um the the death of george floyd and all these other high um, high profile you know cases of police brutality what's happening is our stories are trending again because we get a report of everything that's been read overnight and the number of unique views we get and i've noticed that the articles that i've written in the state of racism are all being read by thousands of people every night so it has definitely brought it back into the forefront um and it has made racism relevant again uh, unfortunately it, there's you know it sort of dips once it go, goes out of public view um so so yeah uh, but obviously me and natalie we've, we're, we've been committed to to dismantling racism since we started and we probably we still will definitely be continuing to do so um but i have to i have to say as well um from my personal circles uh, anyway i haven't seen many white journalists trying to take up space where a person of color or a black person should be writing about racism which i find really encouraging and i think that's a result of online um, media being a lot more um progressive i find um a lot of journalists have sort of they're not they try to you know not being in the same you know echo chamber and um realized and i think a lot of them realized that you know, so, you know this is not appropriate for me to weigh in um and perhaps we should give the opportunity to someone else who has um a better you know perspective to share um but again like i say that is what i see anyway um it could be different on a on a general general basis but from from the white journalists that i work with and the people that i follow online it's been quite encouraging to see that yeah that's good. Um, I, Megan and Raman, I see your questions. I'll come back to them in a second, but I'll just ask Beth's first, um, uh, who says, uh, Hi, Fima. Over the last few days, following the death of George Floyd, it has become apparent to some that the media are not reporting truthfully on the protests. As a young BAME woman, was this ever something that concerned you about becoming a journalist? Um, would, what, sorry, what did what concern me? Um, I so uh, she asks she says it's become apparent that the media are not reporting truthfully on the protests yeah. and was that something that ever concerned you about becoming a journalist 
yeah um she's absolutely right about the media not reporting um truthfully um and also the words uh, this is something i um, tweeted about the other day the words that have been used to cover those protests uh, a lot of the times it's been um covered as a riot even before it was a riot um and also a lot of violent images a lot of uh, you know public pro um, property dis uh, destruction and things like that where you know whereas in in reality a lot of it has been really peaceful um and on monday actually i i, I don't write news stories i'm a lifestyle journalist so everything I, d I do has some sort of human aspect like you know something uh, you know that's not too heavy but it can be heavy sometimes um but i felt like our news team wasn't doing a fair job and uh, of um covering the, the protest so i said to the editor um i actually you know what i'm gonna offer my i'm actually gonna offer to write this story myself because i felt like the, the the writers were just not being fair and a lot of the words that were being used and a lot of the images that were being shown were not you know um representative so i offered to write the story myself because i was like you know what they're not going to do it. i'm just gonna do it myself um, and it was just a piece about of like the beautiful moments of unity from the protest of people dancing, singing, holding hands and so on. Um, but I, it was definitely a worry and it is definitely still a worry that, you know, um, the media is so complicit in shaping the narrative of, of what people think. And it's so important that we we can't be careless with the words that we use, the adjectives, the the images that we show. Um, and I try not to be complicit in that. So um, I always have a, have a think: Am I serving people properly? Am I actually sort of you know um, fighting the good fight, as it were? Um, and those are things I think that a lot of being journalists think about a lot more than others because we do have a community that we need to serve. Yeah, um, I'm a linguist, so I've been getting all my linguist colleagues pointing out lots of things about the wording and like, yeah, you've got to be so aware, haven't you? Yeah. Um, uh, Megan asks um, whether you recommend starting a blog and do you feel like that was a really important factor in helping you get into journalism? Um, obviously this is uh this is a space of like four or five years from when i first started to now um but a lot has changed in those years so i don't know if it really depends on how active you are because um there are loads of blogs that, they, that don't do very well um i my blogs are like gathering dust it's not something i ever look at anymore um but thankfully i don't need to because obviously i've got my um, my full-time job um but I think probably social media is, uh, you know, probably the way forward because um, that's the best way to get your name out there. Um, and sometimes you can say things that you want to say in an article in, in a tweet and it does a better job because it's snappier. And if you're someone who's having, if, you, if you're someone who's making really good points and people are engaging with it, then clearly you're saying something that's highly relatable. So what you could do is you can, that's a good question. What you can do is um, if, you've, if you've got a viral tweet and however many thousands of people are relating to it, you can take that and pitch that to your commissioning editor and say, look, I wrote about X, Y, and Z. These people clearly have thoughts on it. So I would like to do a reported feature on, on this topic, blah, blah, blah. That actually has a lot of merit. Um, and so yeah, social media is definitely a huge factor. TikTok, huge at the moment, obviously, because everyone's bored in lockdown, everyone's downloading it. Um, so if you if you make it, if you make a name for yourself via social media, try and do that. I think that probably has uh, more merit than you know site, setting up a word WordPress blog. Um, uh, and loads of um, journalists, not loads actually, like Sophia um, Gaylor, she's from the BBC, she would probably follow her. She's obviously like killing it. Washington Post, they're doing really, re really well on TikTok. It's a, such a great way to engage um, youngsters and also just see what they're posting about. Um, and they give you so many story ideas. TikTok is honestly such a content mime. There are so many ideas and um, sometimes it's negative. Uh, today I wrote an article about um, this Black Lives Matter inspired makeup that they were doing and it was just literally like, um, I can't breathe on their neck like they used makeup to write that or they had like BLM on their forehead or whatever and it was just like oh, it was really like tasteless so so it can be a hit and miss with TikTok sometimes sometimes you get really good story ideas um, other times you get really bad ones but either way you, you get to write about it so definitely pay attention to your social media um, but that doesn't mean you should grow a following just for the sake of 
making you know being a successful journalist or being a successful you know influencer or whatever just be authentic and genuine like consider what you're saying and is it something that's true is it original is it fair um i think those are important things to think about when you're putting something out there yeah thank you um because it's sort of related i'm going to slightly run together two uh questions mm -hmm. that uh rahman has asked um mm -hmm. so firstly sorry to feel to hear that you feel you have to hold back your much enjoyed opinions yeah. but do you not feel the positive outreach outweighs the negative voices we're not a monolith but it's empowering to know we have a voice comment sections are like yelp reviews you're more likely to leave something negative so that's one part of uh the question and then previously um and which voices from any media form have influenced or challenged you and do you have any recommendations that was a lot of words <laughs> yeah probably just say them in separate separate questions <laughs> sorry okay um what was the first one again <laughs> sorry about, um yeah kind of expressing sympathy and asking whether you feel like the positive outreach outweighs the negative oh. voices and it being empowering to have a voice um when comment sections are kind of yeah likely to be um, negative it's it's really annoying because you can get a, a million positive comments you can get thousands of shares but there's if there's that one comment where they make a point um i'm not talking about the trolling type of comments but if they just sort of say something that you think is a little bit valid that really plays on your mind and it you try not to let it outweigh the overall experience but you just can't help it's just human nature for, to let that pick away at you um for that reason we are encouraged not to read our comment section which can be honestly it's a cesspit sometimes we just they just say don't read it but other times you're tempted with the grooming gangs on i had to see what they were saying um especially after they said my address was posted online i was like oh my god what if they're posting under the article well that would be a great way to get everyone to see where, where i live um so so i so sometimes i do read it even though we're not supposed to and they just rile you up um but other times it's you, you have it's a con conscious effort to not let yourself go down that rabbit hole because you can waste hours just sort of like sort of thinking about the negatives and then it's just really demotivating and you're just like oh i can't be bothered what's the point so it's just like a whole spiraling thing um so yeah it's just something that we, we try not to um try not to do um, yeah you're gonna have to review the second part was i'm sorry um, which voices from any media form have influenced or challenged you? Recommendations, please. Which voice? Mm. Oh, there are so many. Uh, there are so many people that I like read and I'm just like, oh my God, like, I need to be like this. I need to be better. Um, the first person that I could think of, which just comes to mind, is uh, We Are Mel, Mel Magazine, um, Hussein Kasfani. He's also a Muslim journalist. Um, and he, he does really great work. He's really, really um, internet savvy. He does, his, he, he knows all about the internet, like different sort of um, cults and, you know, uh, he's really well versed in um, subreddit, like cultures and stuff like that. He's, he's got a book out as well, really good. Um, it's called Follow um, the Online World of British Muslims, um, which is really good. Um, and it, it's just nice to see someone who's from a similar background, not the same, but a similar background to me, who has been able to cover very niche, very weird and wacky things. Like he doesn't, I think that's a male privilege in, in that as well. I think a lot of women are expected to write their trauma. Uh, this goes out to white women as well, which often uh, expected to write about sexuality or fertility, motherhood, all that sort of stuff, whereas men get to be interesting. Um, so Hussein, and he's obviously he's an interesting person, um, so he's, 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 um, he's written some amazing things for, for Mel. Um, I'm constantly amazed by so many things. Um, Galdem, honestly, if you don't know Galdem, check them out. In the last few years, f four to six years, um, maybe even less, they've just gone from strength to strength. And they were literally just the brainchild of one amazing black woman and she got the funding she needed, she got the staff members, she paid, they all, Galden pays as well, which is so important. You have these huge corporations, like for example, the BBC, I shouldn't name them, but I've been asked to do loads of things with the BBC, I've never been paid for it. Um, and that's the BBC. Um, and then you've got Galden, which is like such a new organisation, and they paid me for, for the, I did a, um, a print issue um, piece with them, and they paid me £80 for that, it was a very short piece. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's, um, and so yeah, definitely follow Galdem, they do amazing work. 
um, there are so many amazing um, people that I, if, if you want me to write a list maybe and have a proper think and send you that document um, to share I'm, I'm definitely happy to do that um, but the good thing about about Twitter is if you follow one person um, and will just give you a suggestion of all these other people to follow you're just constantly going to come across more and more amazing people um, but do try to actively find those voices because they've got so many amazing stories to tell so much talent um, and they deserve our time and attention and our money as well. Yeah, and for a couple of, um, for the white people in the audience, Galdem has lately been putting out a couple of the what can white people do to be good allies type articles as well, which has been helpful. Um, uh, a question which isn't actually a question, but rather a compliment. Um, Venetia Jassal, who's a colleague here at Kent, says, thank you, Faima, for speaking out about sexual abuse. It's very brave of you. Um, and she says, I am researching child sexual abuse in South Asian communities and know mm -hmm. how difficult an area it is to both research and supporting survivors whose voices are very much silenced. So that's just a, a thank you. Um, Heidi says, thanks as well, and asks, what are your top tips for pitching? Um... Again, I'm not the best person to ask because I'm not a freelancer, but uh, I do have freelance friends. Um, I, I get pictures, obviously, to my... All the time. Uh, when you get three, four emails from the same person uh, in a row, uh, and it's the exact same thing, don't do that. Um, don't write an entire thing and send it to them because editors like to have some control in the direction that a story goes. So put your most interesting things in there, put your, the article idea in the subject line, that's important, that's the first thing they'll see. Um, but don't do like, like sort of clickbait stuff, just get right in there uh, and then bullet point, you know, what this is gonna be about, why you are the right person to tell that story, that's really important as well. Uh, and where you, what direction you take it in and then just wait, you know, for the person to reply. Um, if they haven't replied, then definitely do a follow-up email because um, sometimes I get pitches and um, I, don't, um, I don't read it the first time because sometimes you just delete it accidentally or it just goes over your head. But um, the, the second time they send it over, I'm like, oh, I must have missed this, sorry. So definitely worth a follow-up, don't hound the person. And also it's really important to get people's names right. Uh, I always get the name, I always get Fatima, which is fair enough. I, if they say Fatima, I, I forgive them because it's quite easy. It's quite a common uh, a Muslim name, so I, that's fine. But I, I, I get other stuff as well, like Sophie. It's just like, my name is not Sophie. <laughs> so um, definitely pay attention. If you're doing mass emails, which don't, personalise it to each, each um, um, editor. Um, and just be, be super careful with, with what you're saying. Great, thank you. We've managed to work our way through all of the questions in the chat now. So um, if anyone else has a question, type it quickly or put your hand up um, okay. with the button. Um, but I'm taking a video from my Instagram, by the way. So oh. <laughs> I'm going to cross out the names or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Everyone quickly hides their screen. <laughs> um, people in the chat are saying, oh, please give us a list of uh, journalists to follow. Um, but I think, as, as you said, um, once you start following people, you start seeing other people to follow, don't you? So like, yeah. you know, if you follow Galdem, then they're gonna be retweeting people that write for them. And yeah, you start getting a, yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I'll send you that list um, and others or maybe like um, Creative Access and the JDF and all that and links to them. Um, hopefully that should be. Perfect, thank you. So the people who've requested that, if you're, um, it depends who you are. Um, so if you're a student in Seckle, you'll be able to access that. We'll put it on our Moodle page. Um, if you're somebody else, then I guess just get in touch with us and we'll send it on once Fima sends it to us. That's probably the best way. Um, yeah, and then people in the chat are now saying, brilliant talk, great talk, thank you very much. And I would echo those sentiments. I'm gonna hand over to Philippa um, just to say thanks and yeah. You're welcome, that was great, I actually had fun. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Um, okay, so just to finish off then, um, just to echo everything that Laura said, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, Fima, thank you so much. We, I can safely say that I think everyone has really enjoyed that. Interesting, um, insightful, and definitely inspirational. Um, you are in our inspirational speaker series, and I think a lot of students will be very inspired by you. Um, Yes, uh, I, I email, I've been the one emailing everybody. So if anyone does have any follow-up questions, 
then do get in touch with me and I can pass it on to FIMA or you can um, follow her on Twitter. Uh, you're at FIMA, Bar, um, FIMA Bakar, aren't you? Yeah. It's just your name. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, like I said, if there's any follow up questions, then do get in touch uh, with me or Laura or directly to, uh, to find her on Twitter. Um, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Fima. We've really, really enjoyed that. Thank you uh, for having me. Fun. I really enjoyed that as well. And it's so nice to see um, everyone engage as well. Yeah, no, it's really, really good. OK, well, have a nice evening, everybody. And uh, hopefully we'll see everyone again soon for our next um, our next inspirational speaker. OK, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Right. I'm just going to go through the comments. So in case oh, yeah, yeah, I'll leave the, I'll leave the meeting open so that you can have a look through. Do you want me to download the chat for you? Um, yeah, please. You can probably do it yourself, but I'll do it for you now. Okay. Save okay. chat. There we go. That was really great. That was really great. So interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm so happy that they actually asked questions because I was just like, oh, my wife is like really like quiet <laughs> and like dead silence. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have a couple of people left. Um, are you here because you want to ask questions well without everyone else being there, <laughs> or are you just slow to log out? <laughs> Um, yeah, no, thank you, Fima. That was really good. Um, yeah, no worries. I might actually just type messages and just say thank you to everyone. Yeah. The thingy. I can see you being an editor uh, before before long, Fima. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. There's not much money at the moment, so like, who knows what the. It's a tough industry to get into, yeah. but I mean, it's like you said, people will always want journalists. Yeah. There's always going to be stuff to say. It's a very important um, thing to do. Definitely. I'm. By the way, thank you so much for um, asking me to come on this, and and Natalie as well. And she really appreciated it um, and facilitating it. I'm glad that there's like you know conversations like this happening. Yeah. Actually when her books, uh, I don't know what timeline is for her book, but if she wants to plug it um, and come and do a talk for us, when, whenever that's yeah, why ready, not? Let her know. We'd be very happy to to have that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, let us know. Um, so obviously, um, oh, I should stop recording. I'll stop recording now.